uh, a first uh, um, interviewer, Merli Ravi from uh, Jafco Investment. He's based here in Singapore. Please come up, uh, Merli. And uh, he's going to be interviewing. Thank you very much. A little round of applause for Merli. Thanks. And uh, he's going to be uh, interviewing uh, someone from Rocket Internet. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Rocket Internet, it's this uh, juggernaut, uh, juggernaut of an uh, organization uh, based out of Germany uh, that uh, I'm actually uh, a, a fan of. I really uh, am uh, very um, impressed with what they've done, not only around the world, but uh, specifically in, in China and here in Asia. And he's going to be uh, interviewing Stefan Jung from Rocket Internet. Please give a little love. Put your hands together for Stefan Jung, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Hey, Stefan. I think it's on. So it's good that we got our own coffee, right? So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we can just get right, you know, right into it. Uh, as Richard just said, his main favorite of the day is going to be the startup arena. So we're just the warm-up crew. <coughs> We've got to mm -hmm. try and get people awake. So I'm going to ask some questions which uh, you may or may not be aware of, but uh, you know, let's hope the answers are interesting. Anyway, jokes aside, I just want to know, just as a uh, as an opener. How did you get started in Indonesia? You know, obviously, you really look Indonesian. Uh, <laughs> the, the blonde hair fits right in, um, and I'm sure you speak Bahasa fluently. Uh, how did you get started? What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who want to get into this this country, uh, particularly guys from elsewhere? Do you need an Indonesian girlfriend? Uh, how does it work? Well, uh, yeah, born and raised in Indonesia. Uh, no, not really. So I was born in, um, just a quick background, I was born in Germany. Uh, I lived uh, most of my life in Scandinavia, in Copenhagen and in Stockholm. Um, I was a serial entrepreneur, then went into strategy consulting, um, working with uh, the Boston Consulting Group and Bain. Um, and then one of my uh, good friends got recruited to Rocket to head uh, India and Russia operations. And he said, Stefan, I really need your help. Can you take two months off? Um, to help me build an office in, in India. Uh, so I thought, this sounds like fun. I'll do this for two months. But I never came back to BCG. So I, I'm since Rock, um, with Rocket since then, so for around one and a half years now. So I quickly spent time with Jabong, our fashion business in, in New Delhi, um, and then got a call from Oli Samber at Thursday, 7 in the evening, if I want to open up the offices in Southeast Asia. Uh, and 7 in the morning, I was on my flight to Jakarta. Uh, no idea uh, whether I need a visa for Indonesia, how big Indonesia is. Uh, when I landed at airport, I realized I'm an immediate millionaire. So I had literally no idea what I'm doing beforehand. I only got one phone number, which was from, from Jason and Ferry, like the guys from Groupon, now successfully the, the CEOs of uh, Barry Banker and Bilna, crashed for one week in their office and then hired the first person, the second person, and so forth. Um, so that's how I ended up in Indonesia. Uh, so my 50-year life plan uh, from one day to the other, you know, put, put aside. Uh, so now I've been in Jakarta, base, I'm based out of Jakarta for, uh, yeah, since uh, October 2011. Um, I was then the first co-founder of Zalora, first co-founder Lazada. Um, um, Office Fab, Food Panda, and so forth, the whole rocket venture that we started. So now I'm responsible across Southeast Asia of rolling out the, the new ventures. So would you recommend that path? Do you, would you, do you recommend to people that, look, they just jump right into the deep end and just go? Or do you think that they should take the time, at least spend a month doing some research, find out what currency people are using in that country? <laughs> um, yeah, it certainly uh, is, it makes sense to think about things in advance. Um, no, but it's now, so now I've been like a part of the, the ecosystem in Southeast Asia for around one and a half years. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the differences between the countries. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm still based out of Indonesia because for, for us that is, um, I'm part and of obviously like a rocket is a global firm. So I, I would really, you know, in, to generalize for our investors, uh, I think the three main markets right now are certainly India, uh, Brazil, and then uh, right comes Indonesia. So whenever we talk about Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia is certainly like the one country where our, our investors uh, have the most focus on. Um, I often get asked about Singapore, um, Hong Kong. 
Um, but that's relatively small markets, and for, for our global investors, uh, not as interesting. Um, that's why we have uh, most of our ventures haven't actually rolled out in, in Singapore, um, but Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, that's the, that's the markets where, where we make big bets on. I understand. Yeah, I, I do realize, obviously, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong, being so uh, small in terms of population, obviously it becomes less interesting than some of the other places. In fact, my uh, opinion and my experience also has been that because the market is so efficient in some of these places, that's where really the opportunity does not exist. Is it fair to say that, that there's much more opportunity where there's a bit more, uh, let's say, disconnect or inefficiency uh, that you can exploit, uh, an open space that you can occupy? No, certainly. Like, well, if you look at in Singapore, it's if you like, I think it's the the World Bank who makes like the annual study of the ease of doing business. Where I think Singapore is ranked number one. Um, I just spent a week in India again, which is ranked number one hundred thirty-three. So it's much, much more difficult to to launch a venture there. So you have like naturally like an entry barrier. Um, also, Indonesia, um, there is quite some regulation. So, if you're like a first-time entrepreneur, you will run into like a lot of difficulties. Obviously, now we know, we understand the market, how everything works. So, we can very fast launch the ventures. But for uh, first-time entrepreneurs, there are like hurdles which, honestly, I wouldn't even know how to overcome them. Um, an example is like capital requirements for um, you know launching a legal entity. You know, where do you bring one million dollars as like a guarantee for uh, capital requirements? Uh, I can call up Oli Zumber and says, Oli, I need one million tomorrow, and I have one million tomorrow. If I'm, you know, an entrepreneur, first-time entrepreneur, maybe you have rich parents, but it's it's very difficult to just come up with one million. So there, are, you know, certain things which just take time. Registering like a domain name, I still remember. Office Fab is one of our ventures, like uh, selling office supplies online. And um, suddenly, I couldn't register like a domain anymore in Indonesia. So I called the ministry and so forth, and they said they just changed the law. Now we need to present a brand ownership certificate. So I called, where can I get this brand ownership certificate? But no one could tell me. Like the ministry didn't know, no, none of the lawyers knew. So for four weeks, I was calling up people where can I get this brand ownership certificate? And no one had the answer. Um, so that's like things where you run into. In Singapore, probably to a much lesser extent, but in Indonesia, in Vietnam, where everything is in a more earlier stage, you know, you run into, you know, situations like that. That's that's interesting. So, uh, would you solve that by just saying, "Look, I'll just go keep knocking on doors," or do you find local partners who know those particular issues? Like, for example, in India, just to give you an idea. Uh, although you work there, you know I've obviously you know grown up there. The local uh, partnership is not really needed, you know, as long as you're willing to go out and do the work. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, you may need a local partner just to give you some advice, but really it's up to you. There's no requirement that you must have a local partner. But my understanding is Indonesia is different in that way. Vietnam is different in that way. Thailand as well. Would you agree? Yeah, so, certainly. So. Um, I spent some. I, I lived for one year in Beijing. Uh, I, I studied in Beijing, and it obviously, it's like a, a relationship-based society. So the Guangxi of building relationship is crucial, um, you know, to do business there. Indonesia certainly is more, if you have like the axis of transactional-based society versus relationship. Based society, it's very much on the on the relationship-based society. So, yeah, you need the partners. You need to have the right people that you can, you know, talk to and can help you. Um, that's that's very important. So, having then the right connection uh, on the ground is uh, is crucial. Okay, so just switching gears a little bit. You know, you mentioned you've got Office Fab, you've got Jabong, you've got a few other uh, companies around, and in each country, you have a slightly different mix of um, enterprises. Uh, I think it's fair to say that. So how do you go about uh, deciding what enterprise to launch or what opportunity to go and tackle in a given country? And then how do you go about localizing that, if at all? Ma maybe you don't. Yeah. Well, like a, a huge part, I guess, of, of, of the success of Rocket Internet is that we have the global uh, leverage. Mm -hmm. So ideally, we would like take an idea to execution uh, on a global scale. Like a good example is Food Panda, like a food delivery service which we now rolled out in 25 countries around the world um, and on an extremely fast pace. Um, and I think that's like, you know, just 
to take kind of one step back. That's kind of what Rocket, that was what we envisioned when we kind of made the global expansion because people can't forget like one and a half, two years ago, we had two offices, Berlin and Munich. Uh, now we are like in 43 different countries. Um, so when we have an idea, you know, I immediately roll this out in Southeast Asia. I have like then the local co-founders and so forth, so we can execute extremely fast. So it, the 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 number one premise is kind of where that we have like a global potential for an idea, and and then even uh, if it's only based out of then like a region like uh, Southeast Asia, then it's very much like a, a VC you know methodology that you run through like the obviously the attractiveness of the, the market, the size, uh, you know, profitability measures, but then you look at competition and so forth, the scalability. So then we have like a, a VC mindset on, you know, what investments will give us the, the highest returns. Okay, I'll return to the VC mindset uh, in just a bit. I'm also curious about, you know, um, again, I may be wrong about this, but my understanding is because you move so quickly, right? You went from two offices to 43 countries in less than two years. Um, there have been some uh, enterprises in some countries which you've shut down for whatever reason. Maybe you've decided there's a big opportunity elsewhere, maybe whatever was didn't, didn't work, or the people left, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. So that's really my question to you. In Indonesia, I think you haven't really had that experience. You've successfully launched businesses which you have not had to, so far, uh, shut down. But some of the other countries, I'm just reading out uh, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, India, Australia, You've shut down businesses. So what's the difference? You know, is it just the fact that you happen to be based in Indonesia and it worked? Yeah, it's uh, just because of me. <laughs> uh, no, um, it's it's like t to understand our thought process. So if we uh, receive like a next funding round of let's say twenty million dollar from an investor, we then have like this dialogue with our investor group of okay, how do we allocate the capital uh, most efficiently? Um, and I guess the most recent example is that we decided to. Um, in Taiwan that our macro view on Taiwan is not as strong as we have for other countries so we exited glossy box um, we, we, we sold glossy box and now we decided which was in in the press this week that uh, for Zalora our fashion business in Taiwan that we will not have uh, the big global operations of like 100 employees as we had so far but we run it more out of uh, a remote uh, business as we do with the business in Hong Kong so we'll, we'll not shut down the business but we uh, move a lot of like the things to like a kind of a centralized function um, so the thought process is always constantly we're like extremely data driven um, so we constantly reevaluate you know where is the investment where does it make most sense um, in that sense if we, you know, invest one dollar in Taiwan or invest one dollar in Indonesia, you know, what gives us like the most bang for the buck? And in that case, we just made a decision. Um, it makes more sense to spend more money on the other seven countries we are, we are in with Salora in Southeast Asia. So that's very German. It's very, very data, very, very formal. Yep. I, I guess, uh, yeah, but it's like, I think from, from a, it's a constant dialogue we have with investors. So, and that has gone, you know, we, we evaluated the situation over like several months. It's, it's a tough decision to make, um, but I, I think it was the right decision and, and we have a very strong leadership team in, in Zalora with, with, with Michele and Harry. So I think they made the right decision. Okay, I'm just contrasting that with, uh, you know, what I've heard of uh, Jeff Bezos, Amazon. When he started, you know, in the mid '90s, nobody believed him, right? Nobody believed that there was an opportunity. People didn't even know what the internet was, and they said, "Why are you selling books online?" So on and so forth. Even today, his margins are tiny. I think the total profit that Amazon has earned over the life of its existence is less than what Apple earns in one year. So, just you know, two different models, I guess. But the the point I'm trying to make is. Um, he was always sort of passionate about it. Of course, he's got data. Of course, he's a very, very sharp guy. But there's a lot of passion thrown behind an opportunity, and he said, no, 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 we're going to do this for the long term. We're going to do this for the long term. That seems to contrast with, uh, I guess, uh, maybe the word is dispassionate approach that uh, that you guys follow. Okay, so, so I am extremely passionate about entrepreneurship. So <laughs> I can, uh, maybe I come across now as like very data driven, but I'm, you know, I love what I'm doing. And, and I think we, we have been able to recruit so many great entrepreneurs. And that's why, you know, we, we, we have come that far. Um, and that's like how, how Rocket, like, you know, it's, it's a huge universe of, of global entrepreneurs. And, and that makes it so exciting because 
on a daily basis. I talk to my colleagues in, in Brazil, in India, in Australia. And so we all have like a very similar background that we have, you know, certain consulting firms, certain uh, uh, schools that we went to. But we, and that's like the whole global leverage that we have. So we always just need one guy with a smart idea and it doesn't matter if he's in Nigeria or in Pakistan. This is like a global sharing of knowledge uh, on like real-time basis. So you send just like an email to, to everyone. I just crack this idea how we can solve logistics, you know, in, in a certain element. And it goes across the whole world. So, you know, to be part of this, you know, global entrepreneurship club, in a sense, yeah. that's pretty exciting. So, so I'm very passionate about that. Like, uh, so if I come, you know, obviously I had to be more... You know, uh, it's more data driven some decisions, but you know, we are like, uh, you know, I think we love what we're doing. Sure. No, obviously, we spoke yesterday, and I did see that yesterday, and I wanted you to <laughs> convey that to entrepreneurs here as well that, you know, it's not only about data. Um, so, the other question I have for you is uh, again, coming back to Indonesia, when you first entered, or in fact, even until today, what are some of the biggest difficulties you faced? Is it logistics? Is it getting people to buy online? Is it reaching smaller towns? It's hiring people? What is it? No, it's, it's certainly like the, the two pay point, pain points for e-commerce, like uh, in general, are certainly payments uh, and logistics. So that's the, the two uh, big, big problems, um, which is, you know, we have great entrepreneurs seeing uh, developing solutions for all of them. Um, unfortunately, we cannot be part of that due to regulation. Uh, I, I'm really, I, for like three to four months, I looked heavily into if we can do things in payment space ourselves. So you, can um, be, you can't be part of payments, but you can be in logistics, right? Um, th that is right. Um, but in just in terms of payments, then with financial regulations, uh, it would have taken us uh, a little bit more than two years to receive a license to run a, a service in the financial services industry. So that's not really the, the rocket speed to wait for two years for something. So, um, but now we have like a new vehicle like with a global founders fund. So, so rocket as the incubator, but now we have the global founders capital, which we announced two weeks ago. So it's a $200 million fund that we raised where we can now, um, as a typical VC, um, support entrepreneurs. And there's a lot of great entrepreneurs in, in Indonesia, all across Southeast Asia working on solutions there. Um, so there we are very interested in, in now through a BC arm to, to invest in these solutions. But in general, you know, the problems we face, yeah, payments and logistics are the two major difficulties. Okay. So I, uh, I personally, I look at a lot of businesses in India, right? So that's really part of my day job. I don't do as much in, Indo in Indonesia. Um, one of the key problems I see with uh, startups in India is... Uh, well, this, it's kind of two related problems. One is it's hard to attract great quality people. People are, even today, when they have seen a lot of startups come up, even today people say, uh, particularly because of family pressure or, you know, uh, your mother might say, why are you going and joining this small company? You work for Microsoft, don't you? You know, you, you get a great salary and so on. Why do you want to join the small company? Do you see a similar sort of uh, uh, mentality in Indonesia or some of the other countries you operate? Yeah, certainly at the beginning. So, so uh, when I came here, I, I had no office, I had nothing, <clears throat> and I made like the first meetings with you know senior buyers from all the big fashion houses, and I told them about the idea that we want to start like uh, the largest online fashion store and so forth, and they just looked at me, you know, dude, you're like number twenty, who telling me this? So at the beginning it was very tough. Uh, you know, obviously, I told them about our, you know, track record that we have been very successful in Brazil. Now, in, in Europe, like Zalora in, in, in Europe is called uh, Zalando, which is the, the fastest ever European company, which reached $1 billion in sales. So, obviously, we have been very successful in other parts of the world, but we were new here. So, it was very difficult at the beginning to attract them. So, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you know, Rocket Internet is overpaying. I think that was just a necessity at the beginning in order to attract people to like a, you know, and it's a new industry, e-commerce is just developing. Um, but now we probably can even pay a discount because people, you know, want to work for us and they see the buzz and kind of the growth that it has. So that has certainly shifted. So the problem is much less in attracting great people, it's rather uh, retaining the best people. 
because now we develop them for one year, one and a half years, and they probably have state-of-the-art knowledge when it comes to online marketing or some other uh, uh, you know, fields. And we see that people get poached like left and right um, every day. So because that knowledge that they you know, learned within Rocket is very valuable. So, so that's now our problem that to retain people. And, and also here, like just yesterday, it, it felt almost like a little Rocket mini reunion. Um, it's so many entrepreneurs which just, you know, they learned the things at Rocket and then said, you know, it's not rocket science. I can do this myself. Um, and it's actually, you know, that's great. So we probably contribute a lot into the, the, the ecosystem here that not only investors we bring here for the very first time, uh, but also like a lot of people which probably wouldn't have joined the startup scene before, you know, many strategy consultants or investment bankers, then suddenly just spun out and, and just they launched their own ventures. Um, mm -hmm. So that's now a, a bigger problem for us to, to keep the best people. So that's your community service, right? Yes, so yeah, <laughs> we're, we're not n necessarily a non-profit organization, but we do some community service by bringing entrepreneurs here. Yeah. Right, but how do you retain people? I mean, this problem was the second problem I was going to allude to, right? Uh, in India, people have, particularly younger uh, employees, will leave in you know, eight months, 12 months, 15 months. If you're a two-year-old person in a company, you're like one of the oldest persons in the company. How do you deal with that? Do you have something similar uh, in Indonesia? Yeah, I, I, I think the first 20 CVs that I, I received then from search firms, like none of them has stayed with their firm for more than two years, you know, over like 10 to 15 years. So people move very quickly. So there's l relatively little loyalty to your employer. Um, so we... I can speak most of Indonesia because there I spent the most time sure. with and that's the office that I built. So we really try to you know, make a culture which maybe some people don't actually associate with Rocket because the, you know, obviously there are some negative uh, things are featured more in the press than the positive ones. But we really try to create like a great uh, you know, working culture where people say, okay, this is an extremely flat organization. It's really fun to work at. And, you know, and I want to stay there. If I would just now go to like one of the more established uh, you know, department stores, which are now building an, offline, uh, an, an online business, you know, it would be very hierarchical and I wouldn't enjoy the work so much. So it's like thinking through, you know, we're talking about very ambitious, like 25 to 30 year olds. What is important for them? Why do they choose a workplace over another? And then it's about creating the environment so, so they don't want to leave. Got it. Um, how afraid are you of uh, Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Alibaba, 360 Buy? No. Uh, no, I'm... I'm, I'm no, but it's, it's you know, I, I admire Jeff, Jeff Bezos and he's, you know, one of the, the best entrepreneurs the world has seen over the last decades, you know. Uh, you know, it's amazing what he has built. But because of his decisions, like Rocket Internet exists, that it's a typical example that, you know, it's 2013 and Amazon is in, what, seven countries? Um, so it's because of like this extreme focus uh, of the US, uh, it is an opportunity to globalize investment ideas where you know, startup founders haven't you know, done before. Um, and that's probably like a, a thing where Rocket kind of changes a lot of like the global entrepreneurship. You know, it's the whole kind of ventures uh, system that we impact that um, founders in Silicon Valley realize, okay, we have to expand much faster. Um, because there will be, you know, people realize that a, it's a huge business opportunity to bring ideas, proven business models in, in, in other parts of the world. So, uh, and I think that's a great thing. It's just, you know, looking at, at Square um, with, uh, with um, uh, <laughs> I forgot his name, Jack. Uh, yeah, oh, um, Jack Dorsey, thank you. Um, so Jack Dorsey, um, you know, he's probably one of the entrepreneurs who has the most connections uh, due to his path with, with you know, obviously Twitter and uh, you know he has like yep. some of the best VC funds supporting him, but he launched it in 2007 and and even though Square has been re tremendously successful in the US, now slowly I think in the second quarter of this year he's he's planning of expanding to Canada, so by the <laughs> time he will uh, you know reach Europe, um, it, it will take some time. So obviously we have built 
the square business in Europe like over a year ago and we are like market leader and we're like growing extremely fast. So instead of consumers have to wait for like a product or service for, you know, literally in the past it has been four to five years often, you know, they will have access to, to services right away. Um, and I think that's a mindset. So now people realize we, they have to expand globally much faster. So VC funds have to write much bigger tickets in A round uh, in order to, to push the global expansion. Uh, and I think that's for, for people in, in Asia or, or Europe a great thing that you know, they actually have access now to these, to these new, new, new services. Okay, so I've got you know, one or two last questions. So um, one is you know, going back to the point you made about VC mindset. Now, I know you have strong views about uh, the whole VC model, uh, but I know that they don't know that. Why don't you share with us? Um, no, I, I think it's, it's uh, because I often get it asked about, you know, what is the impact of Rocket on the, on the venture capital uh, business model? Um, and, you know, the way that when, when we started and envisioned what Rocket could be, we had like the whole in investment, you know, landscape in mind. So you have late stage LBOs, you have the, the Blackstone, the KKRs, earlier stage than with venture capital, you have the Andreessen Horowitz, the Sequoias. The Jeffcos. Or the, the Jeffcos. Uh, it, it, I just uh, <laughs> thought about that as well. And then we have, obviously then we, we saw like an incubator, you know, to actually incubate the idea is a whole asset class in itself. And, and for endowment funds, you know, for, in, uh, for LPs, that is a very uncorrelated ways of, of getting returns in their portfolio. Um, so that's kind of how we see ourselves as like an incubator. Um, and we have obviously been very successful, so the returns have been quite high and more money gets actually then shifted to the incubator class. Um, and obviously venture capital firms realize that. If you look at uh, to actually not only just inject 5 million, 10 million of you know, capital, uh, because at some point capital just becomes a commodity, you actually really talk about the value add. So I think a lot of VCs have to like reflect, you know, what is the real value add we can give to our portfolio companies. And, you know, certainly I think what Andreessen Horowitz does uh, will be the, you know, the story that a lot of VC funds will follow. Like Andreessen Horowitz, they have seven investment partners, but they have 60 operating partners. So they built their own online marketing division. They built their own recruiting division. They have their own M&A corporate development group, uh, business development group. So, um, you know, that's a huge value add for their portfolio companies. I think now they have like once a week where the CTO from Citigroup would come and all their uh, uh, SAS uh, startups can pitch to him. So that's a huge value add. So, so um, I think a lot of like VC funds need to kind of build um, that as well in order to actually really add value to their portfolio companies. So that's pretty much the same as, you know, late stage private equity. You know, Blackstone does pretty much the same. They exactly. do their own M&A advisory. Exactly. So if you look at like the, the, the private equity firms which have been the most successful over the last two decades, um, it's certainly KKR. And KKR has more people now in their capstone team, the operating team, than in their investment team. Uh, the same with Bain Capital. So I think venture capital firms can see a lot and learn a lot from, from the private equity firms as well. Got it. So I guess one, one last one just to round off. So given the fact that you think that VC model doesn't work or it needs to, 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 to morph over time. It will work, but for like a small amount of VCs than it has been in the past. Got it. So then why are you getting into VC? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it seems like a contradiction at first now, but it's because we see and I think we understand markets. Um, that we operate in now through Rocket, there are a lot of like investment opportunities where we can't just do it with Rocket, whether it's regulation with payments or simply that we were too late and we can just inject a huge amount of capital, but we will still be number two or number three in, in three years. Um, and that's just not what we want to do. So, so now that the global founders capital is, is a great way for, you know, then helping entrepreneurs and then kind of they can tap to a certain extent into you know, the rocket knowledge and rocket universe. So I think through that fund we can, it's a lot of like, it's f by founders for founders. So um, so I think, you know, in terms of value add, I think actually like the G, uh, G, uh, the Global Founders Fund can actually add value to, to the founders. Okay, so it's not about management fees, right? Because again, in, in VC, there are funds which need to get bigger and bigger over time so that they can actually sustain their operations. 
as you know, it's uh, the fees that people earn are based as a percentage of assets under management. Uh, for whatever reason, we are we aren't that way. We've always maintained the fund size as pretty much the same. Um, but I guess I, I'm guessing that that's not the reason for. No, but it's also if you look. Uh, so the gl global founders capital um, has emerged out of the European Founders Fund. Um, and the European Founders Fund, the Summer Brothers, have been very successful with this fund for you know many many years. Uh, they were early investors in Facebook, which obviously hasn't done too bad. Uh, they were early investors in LinkedIn, in HomeAway, so that been some of the the most successful investments. Uh, but that was through the European Founders Fund. But now uh, the investment thesis of Rocket and now also the Global Founders Fund is it's much more that the growth will come from emerging markets. So if you look at just the allocation of capital, um, you have, if you take the US and China, which are not core markets of Rocket, uh, you have 51% of GD global GDP is in these two countries, but you have the number that I heard is around 82% of venture capital money is allocated to these countries. Right. So we think a lot of like countries as Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Nigeria, Pakistan, and, and so forth, are underfunded. And this is our investment thesis that, um, you know, that, that's where we want to be. Totally agree. So, I, I, you know, very happy to hear that you guys are getting involved more and more in, in, in this part of the world. Completely agree with the disconnect. And we'd love to work alongside many of the entrepreneurs here, I'm sure, also will love to work alongside uh, what Rocket is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.